um, after you know flying helicopters and you know that type of thing. And I don't know. Maybe I can teach you how to fix vibration problems. Are you with me? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of case histories that I've kind of worked on over uh, over my career. And I think case histories are a good learning tool. You kind of see the approach, and, and it gives you kind of like we, we came, we saw, we conquered, and, you know, that type of thing. So we're going to be doing a number of case histories uh, this morning that are just titled How to Fix Vibration Problems. And generally, we're looking for something not to put a Band-Aid on it, but to do root cause failure analysis type of fix. All right, fix the problem so hopefully it won't uh, occur again. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is a boiler feed water pump. And it had excessive vibration again at its turning speed. Much smaller uh, pump here. That's the motor. It's coupled, directly coupled to a boiler feed water pump. Uh, it's a two pole motor, so it runs nominally 3600 RPM, 3595, something like that uh, RPM. This is a new installation of a used motor. Right? Previous motor had a problem. They didn't have a spare. They went out and bought a used motor that would kind of fit in the hole. You know, it had the horsepower and that type of thing. But they had to, it had a larger, the original motor had a larger footprint. The span between the anchor bolts was longer. So they had to do some modifications to the base plate in order to uh, install, uh, install this motor. All right, uh, we can see here we've got a data collector. We were taking readings on both ends of the motor. This is the now motor drive end vertical and the motor drive end axial. The vertical had 0.5 inches per second of vibration, higher than we would certainly like to see it. All that one times the turning speed. The axial was 0.35 inches per second, and again, at the turning speed, uh, the highest peaks. All right. Well, now we get into the, it's a motor that's shaking. The electrical engineer was the one that found this motor and had it installed. The mechanical people, the millwrights, we you know, were the ones that did the installation and did the alignment. And of course, the electrical engineer said, there is nothing wrong with the, my motor. It's the alignment wasn't done right. You know, and so we ended up you know, coming in and, and looking. And again, the, the horizontal was low, but the vertical was high. And he said, you, you did, they just didn't do the right job of, of alignment. We came in, we did the alignment, said there's really nothing wrong with the alignment. All right. Well, he didn't want to hear that. Um, Jason, is, is he in here? I don't think so. He was the lucky one that was out there, you know, when, uh, you know, when we checked the alignment and said there's nothing wrong with the alignment. And the electrical engineer and the maintenance engineer almost came to blows over this because the electrical engineer is still saying it's not anything wrong with the motor you know, all of this type of thing, and they just didn't want to talk to each other. All right, so again, we looked and said, well, there's a, there's a large difference between the vertical, all right, and the horizontal, and the axial is high also, but the vertical is much, much higher. So might this be a resonance situation? We made changes to the structure. We also changed the mass of the motor. It's a different motor. So it, you know, it potentially could have a different weight mass than the previous motor that was in there. So we said, well, again, we're pointing to this might be a resonance situation resulting from poor support stiffness uh, in the base plate. So we said, okay, we again, what kind of a test plan? What can we, what can we do? We can do online testing. All right, we could measure not just the amplitude of the vibration, but also measure the phase angle that says, how does one point on the motor move you know, respect to the other point? Is this a, a motor sitting there doing this? Is it doing a rocking motion? 
you know, trying to determine what does this really look like and does it look like it's, again, an alignment issue or does this look like it might be a resonance issue? All right, and try to visualize, like on the previous where we did a modal study, try to visualize what's called an operating deflection shape. How is this motor moving? All right, um, to try to, to then determine what could cause it to move? What forces could cause it to move in that direction? All right, they didn't want to shut the machine down, all right, unless they had to. They had a spare pump, but, you know, trying to, to, to juggle boiler feed water pumps if you've been in, in power plants, um, they don't like changing things, particularly boiler feed water pumps, when they're online because there's always a chance that they could crash the unit. And so they didn't want us to do offline testing. We could go in and measure the 1x amplitude and phase, do a bump test like we did in the previous you know, uh, case history to see if there's a resonance. They weren't real happy about doing that. It's doable, but there's a risk involved. Yeah, the question was, what, what did the horizontal look like? What was, how, how was its amplitude relative to the vertical that was high? I, didn't, I don't have a, plan, a plot of that. The high one was the vertical and the axial. Uh, the horizontal was, was low, but I'm not sure what it was right now. Okay. All right, so the offline testing was, was not our you know, first, first thing that the customer would be happy about doing. So he said, okay, let's go in and measure the phase angle. Now we can't shut it down. A lot of you may be used to getting phase measurements. You put a piece of tape on the shaft and you use a photo tack. Well, 3,600 RPM, I'm not quick enough to put the tape on the shaft, okay? Uh, plus OSHA gets a little bit upset about doing things like that, so. Uh, so we said, well, what we're going to do is we have a two-channel vibration analyzer that allows us to get what's called cross-channel phase. We put two sensors on at the same time, and we measure the phase reference between those two to see if they're in phase or out of phase, all right, to give us an idea of how this machine uh, is, is vibrating. And this is a... Uh, uh, a picture of, or what we had was, we had out of phase motion in the vertical direction from one end to the other end of the, of the motor, all right? Motor was in phase in the horizontal direction. So now you look at the motor and it's doing this in the vertical and it's doing this in the horizontal. So it's kind of like, you know, a weird shape. And looking at the difference between the motor and the pump, taking a axial measurement on the motor and an axial on the pump, we saw that those were out of phase. Now, if you look at the, the plot here, it shows that they're in phase because it shows that the phase angle is only 0.4 degrees. So that would say they're in phase. Right? But the accelerometers, one was mounted in this direction, the other was mounted in this direction, pointing in opposite directions. That automatically gives you a 180 degree phase shift in the way you set the things up. So even though it shows that they're in phase, they really are out of phase. The motor and the pump were, were out of phase. Okay, next thing we said is, well, let's, let's look at this data. Does it tell us anything? And we're still looking at it. This is like a rocking motion, all right, on, in the vertical, which is where the high. If we have a rocking motion, What's that going to do to your axial? That's going to give you some axial motion. So that might explain why vertical and axial are high. Horizontals are pretty good. All right. So we said either we have severe misalignment or resonance. Well, we already checked the alignment. All right. That was, that was checked probably two weeks before, and they were still arguing over what the, the problem is. All right. So the next thing, and to check the alignment again, would have required a shutdown and they didn't want to do that. So we said as well, let's go in and see if it's a resonance. Now, 
if you have a resonance condition, the way you fix it is to change something. There's three different things that you can change. Usually one of them isn't the easiest, and that's change the speed. If, if this was on a variable frequency drive and they could live with running this thing at, at 3,000 RPM instead of 3,600, that might be an option. In here, it's not an option, so we couldn't change the speed. So the other thing is we have to change the two other things that we can change, and that's the stiffness all right, and the mass. Natural frequency, this is the formula for natural frequency. It's 1 over 2 pi times the square root of the stiffness divided by the mass. Now think of this as, as looking at, let's say, a guitar. All right, the larger diameter strings have more mass. What does that do to the frequency of the note that you get with large diameter strings on a guitar? They're lower, right? Well, if mass is higher, it's in the denominator that will lower the natural frequency. If you tighten the string, what does that do to your frequency, to the note? It raises it, all right? And so that's the whole principle of a stringed instrument is based on that formula. When you pluck a string, it vibrates at its natural frequency, all right? And it's K upon M, K over M. All right, so there's two things that we could do here. We could change the stiffness or we could change the mass. All right, if you increase the stiffness, we just talked about, um, or decrease the mass, then you raise the natural frequency. All right, if you decrease the stiffness or increase the mass, then you lower the natural frequency. So we have two things that we can, that we can potentially play with here to try to detune this to, we can't eliminate a natural frequency, but we can eliminate resonance, which is excitation of that natural frequency. We're going to move that natural frequency to some frequency location that doesn't bother us, that isn't, isn't uh, excited by something in the machine. Okay, so what we did is we put some temporary wood wedges and drove those in under the support frame to increase, this had a piece of channel that went across, um, and then there, there was a concrete pedestal, there was two pieces of I-beam, and then a piece of channel that went across, and they put the channel across to support the motor, so the motor is bolted down to the channel. <laughs> All we did was put wedges in the center between the channel and the concrete base, and just drove some wooden wedges in, two by four, and wooden wedges. And the vibration amplitude, this is now the vertical. We went from 0.5 inches per second with wood wedges, drove it down to about 0.14 inches per second. All right, without ever shutting the motor down, you know, nothing real fancy uh, here. And that's just with wooden wedges. All right, so what we had to do then, the permanent modification was put some steel columns and weld them underneath. It's real hard to see here, but there's a brace that goes from the concrete base up to that piece of channel iron to stiff arm that channel iron, raise its frequency, thereby changing the natural frequency to be above the running speed of the machine. And the vibration amplitudes were significantly reduced. Now this is a nice case history because they did go back and put the steel you know, weld the steel and everything else in. There's any number of times that we've put the wedges in there and they, they just, that's it, the, the, that problem's over, let's go fight the next fire, you know. And that lasts, you know, for six months until the wedges, you know, fall out and then they have a vibration problem again. So, um, it was nice that they, they did go back and while the machine was running, they welded these in place, never had to you know, had to shut it down again. Okay, so sometimes the quick fixes uh, are great, but they don't, again, solve the root cause if they don't go back and do a permanent, uh, permanent fix.